Hello, I'm Dr. John Cavanaugh, and this is AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, Lesson 7, Part 2. We're going to talk about pretrial activities. And the first pretrial activity uh, is also the first appearance or the initial appearance. This is the first time the person who's been arrested is taken before a court. At this proceeding, a judge will give the defendant a formal notice of what he or she is being charged with and their constitutional rights. Uh, the reason why the person is told what they're charged with is because many people, when they're arrested, are intoxicated and don't really know what they did. Or there may have been a change from the police officer's initial arrest charge uh, uh, when the prosecutor got a hold of the case and altered the charges. So at this point, the uh, defendant knows what the actual charges are, and the judge will also inform, give the defendant uh, his or her constitutional rights, like to an attorney, confront witnesses, and what have you. Uh, in addition, uh, at the first appearance, the person has an opportunity to get a lawyer if that person doesn't have one already, or if they're indigent, the court will appoint a lawyer at this point. Uh, there's also possibly an opportunity to post bail. Now, bail is money or a bond left with the court, which is forfeited, it's taken by the court, not returned to the defendant, if the released defendant fails to appear in court on the, on the next due date. Bail, <clears throat> bail also allows innocent people to avoid incarceration pending trial uh, or a later court appearance, and we'll discuss those later on. Now, bail is in lieu of pretrial detention, which is usually only required for serious crimes. Persons charged with less serious crimes who have no outstanding arrest warrants are usually released on their own recognizance. Uh, that's called being ROR. In other words, the judge says, come back in this state for the next hearing. If you don't, uh, I'll issue an arrest warrant for you and you'll be held in contempt of court. So most people are ROR'd. More serious crimes or flight risks, they have to usually post bail or they're not released at all. Now, bail is paid in cash or bond obtained from a bail bondsman. So if the judge, like a judge may say to a person, uh, in your particular case, uh, $10,000 bail or, or, uh, or well, $10,000 bail or $100,000 bond. So if that means that you can come in with $10,000 cash of your own or you have to get a bail bond. Uh, you go to a bail bondsman or, or bail bondswoman, uh, and you would, if you don't have the cash, and you would go to a bail bondsman or woman, and you would, they would give you a bond for the amount uh, that the court requires to release you, and you have to secure that bond with your property. So you have to sign as collateral your car or your house or, or something of value. So that if you don't show up and the court keeps the bail bondsman's money bond, the bail bondsman can seize your car or put a lien on your house and, and get his or her money back. Um, now, this first appearance, by the way, must occur without unnecessary delay, uh, and this generally should be within 48 hours. So once a police officer arrests you, they have to get you before a judge within 48 hours or your constitutional rights have been violated. In most states, you're taken before a judge within 12 hours, but 48 is the maximum limit because we do not want uh, uh, the detention of people who have not been found guilty for extended periods of time uh, without seeing the judge. Okay, the next possible hearing in this process, and I'm assuming that there was not a plea bargain uh, at the arraignment, which can occasionally happen, the next possible uh, court appearance is the probable cause hearing. Now, the probable cause hearing determines if police officers who arrest persons without warrants had probable cause at the moment of the arrest to believe that a crime had been committed and that the defendant committed the crime. Remember, the Fourth Amendment makes it clear. Uh, it, it, the government cannot seize your person, which is an arrest, right, unless they have probable cause. So without probable cause, any arrest is illegal, is unconstitutional. So at the probable cause hearing, the officer or the prosecutor must convince the judge at the moment of the arrest, the facts known to the police officer amounted to probable cause that you committed the crime. If probable cause was not present, the defendant may be released and any evidence seized uh, to, uh, at the arrest may be excluded. So if you were illegally arrested and you were searched incident to the arrest and they found illegal drugs, 
If the arrest was illegal, then the search was illegal, and the, those drugs are excluded and can't be used against you, and you can't be charged with them. In addition, if you made admissions because you were being illegally held, those admissions would be also be excluded and could not be used in court against you. And by an admission, I mean maybe you said you did it, or maybe you said uh, that you owned a gun like that, and, and that can be used as evidence uh, in the case later on. Uh, so that's how the Fourth Amendment works. It's called the exclusionary rule. The probable cause hearing may be held independently, or it could be held as part of the initial hearing or a later preliminary hearing. Now, in some jurisdictions, you have a grand jury hearing. Uh, uh, and the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution gives all citizens the right to have the evidence collected against them be reviewed by a grand jury to see if there exists a prima facie case to hold the person for trial. Now, a prima facie case is one where the evidence at first glance, that's what prima facie means. It's a Latin for it, first look. So a prima facie case is one where the evidence at first look would leave a reasonable person to conclude that a crime was committed and that the defendant committed the crime. Now by first look, what we mean is uh, that the evidence is given by the prosecutor to the grand jury and the defense attorney, who is not present at the grand jury hearing, doesn't have the opportunity to rebut it, to make you look at it a second time more closely. So that's a prima facie case. Now grand juries are comprised of 23 citizens who hear evidence presented to them by the prosecutor, and then they vote to indict or release. Now a grand jury verdict is not one of guilt or innocence. It only allows the prosecution to proceed with the case to a trial down the system. Down the system. Remember, the grand jury hearing is a protection in the Constitution that allows ordinary citizens to screen the actions of the police and the prosecutors to ensure that they uh, had good reason to arrest and hold you for trial. Uh, and it's a protection against the abuse by the government. It comes from England, where most of our laws have come from. In England, there was an oppressive king who was oppressing the people, locking up people who opposed him, putting them in the Great Tower. And then because he had no real evidence against them, you know, after a year he would release them. Uh, but that had quite a chilling effect on dissent. So uh, because of this and other abuses, the, uh, the more wealthy people in that country, the noble people, uh, were going to rise up and revolt against the king. And the king got worried. He sat down and he spoke with them. And they agreed on reforms. Uh, and they put these reforms in a great document, which they called the Charter. And it was the Great Charter or the Magna Carta. And uh, that is the basis of, of the rights of English people. And because we were an English colony, those rights came to the U.S. And when we became independent of England, we still kept most of those things. And one of those rights uh, and protections from the Magna Carta was the right to a grand jury hearing. Uh, so grand juries uh, are secret. They're not public hearings. They're held in secret. And they generally, not, uh, generally neither defendant nor his or her attorneys are present. So grand juries are still greatly weighted in favor of the prosecutor. But the prosecutor still must convince a majority of the 23 jurors there by presenting evidence or witnesses to those 23 grand jurors. They have to convince them that there's enough evidence to believe that a crime occurred and, and that the, the person being held did it uh, at first glance. And if the grand jury, a majority agrees, they indict and the prosecutor can proceed with the case. If they don't, the defendant must be released. And the defendant can only be rearrested if the prosecutor and police get new evidence, go back to the grand jury, represent, and get an actual indictment. Now, because the grand jury is secret and greatly weighted in favor of the prosecutor, because defense attorneys can't present evidence, a lot of states have replaced grand jury hearings with preliminary hearings. And it's a similar thing, but it's run by a judge instead of a grand jury. And the defense attorney gets to be there and gets to argue the defendant's side uh, about being held or not held uh, before the judge who makes the decision. Okay, let's talk about the preliminary hearing. Uh, in a state where there's no grand jury hearing, uh, the, 
after the probable cause hearing, the case would go to a preliminary hearing. And again, we're assuming that there wasn't a plea bargain uh, at the probable cause hearing, where the defendant pled guilty to a lesser charge, or we're assuming that the case wasn't dismissed by the judge at the probable cause hearing, stating that there was no probable cause. So now we're at the preliminary hearing, and here prosecutors will file complaints, and these complaints are called informations, because they contain information about the case, accusing the defendant of a crime. At a preliminary hearing, the judge hears arguments from the prosecutor and the defense counsel, along with the testimony of witnesses as to whether probable cause exists to proceed to trial. Preliminary hearings are adversarial, and witnesses can be called. Uh, Issues of the defendant's competency to stand trial uh, are also addressed at a preliminary hearing. If uh, the defense attorney believes that this person is insane, uh, then they may very well request at this point that the, there be a medical review and then a court decision based on that. If a defendant is released at the preliminary hearing for lack of probable cause, the prosecution may reintroduce the case later should additional evidence become available. Uh, let's now talk about the arraignment and the plea. The arraignment is the defendant's first appearance before the court, which has authority to conduct a trial. So if we're at this stage, that means that we've gone through all the other hearings and there has been, the case has not been thrown out and there has been not, there has not been a plea bargain. So now we're going to go to a trial. So the first pre-trial activity uh, after the others is the arraignment and the plea. Uh, it's the defendant's first appearance, not before a court, because the defendant has been before courts already. This is the first appearance before a court which has the authority to conduct a trial. At the arraignment, the defendant is again informed of the charges and is now allowed to enter a plea. And the plea is his or her formal answer to the charges. Plea bargains are often made at this stage in the judicial process, uh, and over 90% of uh, guilty dispositions result from plea bargains. The criminal justice system could not result without plea bargains. If everybody wanted a trial, we don't have enough judges and enough courts to conduct those trials. So plea bargains are a big part of the system. And the fact that most of the people who are arrested committed the crime doesn't make it, it particularly um, troubling that 90% of these people plead guilty because Usually they get in a better deal than if they went to trial. And the taxpayers save a lot of money in, in expensive trial costs. Now, pleas generally include guilty, not guilty, or nolo contendere. Nolo contendere is Latin, and it means no contest. It is an admission of guilt, but it cannot be used against the defendant in a civil trial. So if you punch somebody or got into a fight, and you were allowed to plead nolo contendere, you'd be sentenced like you're guilty, but the person who you uh, assaulted and injured, if they're suing you civilly for damages, they couldn't use your nolo contendere plea as evidence that you're, you're blameworthy for assaulting them, which would help their civil, civil case to get money from you. Uh, so judges rarely allow nolo contendere pleas because it does, does disadvantage the victim of the crime. Okay. So that ends lesson seven. So study hard and uh, take the lesson seven test and then move on to lesson eight.